Before the clock starts ticking on behalf of the noble uh, and, and gallant Lord, Lord Dannett, might I just assist the high House with the uh, guides about timing tonight? Because the noble uh, Lord, and gallant Lord's uh, question for short debate is now last business, it does mean, according to the, the rules in our companion, that instead of just one hour, uh, he is allocated one and a half hours. Now, I know this brings some joy to some of our colleagues because it means that uh, uh, those who are speaking from the back benches and the opposition front bench spokesperson, instead of having three minutes, now could stretch to five before they exceed their allotted time. Um, I know that it doesn't bring great joy to all because they have worked their evenings out on the basis that the, the time of this debate will be from about 7.30 to 8.30. So my lords, um, I also want to say that I think that uh, there is a speaker in the gap as well who knows the, the time limit will be four minutes as a maximum for them. Um, I think that there is a mood around the House that briefer is better, but I'm sure to be a quality debate as always in those matters. My Lords, in opening this evening's short debate, uh, may I first thank those noble Lords who are taking part this evening, um, albeit somewhat later than we had anticipated, um, and other noble Lords who have indicated their interest in this question, but are not able to be in their places. To me, this level of participation underlines the importance of the matters that we're considering. I'm also aware that this short debate comes hard on the heels of the Defence Reform Bill, which has now passed all its stages in our Lordship's House, and that the question of manning the Army Reserve was the subject of some discussion. Indeed, I spoke on the subject at the committee stage and was minded to put an amendment uh, at the report stage. However, I make no apology for returning to this key topic this evening. And I do so now in the context of both regular and reserve manning, not just for the Army, but for the Royal Navy, the Royal Marines and the Royal Air Force too. My Lords, I believe that this subject can only be properly addressed if it is done so within its full context. It seems to me that when the Coalition Government took its decisions on the size and shape of the armed forces at the time of its Strategic Defence and Security Review, in 2010, it did so against the background of the way the world looked then and in the midst of the economic crisis. We were then in the early days of the current age of austerity. In headline terms, a decision was taken to prioritise defence equipment over manpower, a not altogether unreasonable decision given, given the long lead times in defence procurement and the need to preserve British jobs in defence industry. However, in order to balance the books, manpower reductions of 30,000 personnel across the three armed services were required, which inevitably would fall most heavily on the Army, but they also fell with considerable impact on the other services, in particular on our ability to man the fleet both now and in the future, especially when the Queen Elizabeth-class aircraft carriers and the new offshore patrol vessels come into service. As regards the Army, the mitigation of the risks inherent in a 20,000 cut in regular army manpower would be the recruitment and training of the army reserve of 30,000, giving an overall integrated army manpower strength of 112,000. Put like that, this looks to be a reasonable outcome. But doubt has remained as to whether the regular army component of just 82,000 of that overall total is sufficient for the nation's needs and whether the target of 30,000 trained reservists to round out Army 2020 is even achievable. My Lords, when this policy was announced, it was originally stated that the major drawdown of regular manpower would not occur until the strength of the reserves had risen to or to near their projected target. However, after a reworking of the finances within the MOD, this policy was changed. And in the case of the Army, the drawdown to 82,000 regulars has now been very nearly completed with little upward shift in reserve manning. Uh, Noble Lords have observed previously in this House that this shift of policy carries an acknowledged level of risk. I'd be interested to know if the Noble Lord the Minister is confident that this risk is being managed and mitigated both for now and in the foreseeable future. I raise this question at this time because with the planned culmination of our operations in Afghanistan, 
linked to a general feeling of war weariness and war wariness, given our recent experiences in both Iraq and Afghanistan, it could be argued that concerns about the size of the army today were theoretical rather than immediate. But, my lords, I believe that view overlooks the current strategic landscape. While there is neither a logic nor an appetite for, convention, for intervention in Syria, nor a treaty obligation requiring military intervention in Ukraine, both situations stand as stark examples of how the strategic landscape can change. Predicting the future is a notoriously hard thing to do, and strategic shocks happen. The invasion of the Falkland Islands, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Iraq invasion of Kuwait, and 9-11 were all unpredicted events that had major consequences for our defence and security policies and capabilities. It's often said that, about predicting the future that the trick is not to be so far wrong that when the future reveals itself, you cannot adapt quickly to the new circumstances. But circumstances have changed since 2010 and are changing at the present time. They are plain to see, provided there is a willingness to look. I believe these strategic changes change, change our previous risk calculations. The Russian takeover of Crimea may not have been to President Putin's timing, but it certainly suits his agenda and aspirations. Whether or not his ambition reaches into eastern Ukraine or elsewhere, only he really knows. But with a Russia resurgent in both confidence and military capability, this is a poor moment in many observers' judgment for the US-led West to be weak in both resolve and muscle. Diplomacy and economic sanctions may be the right response for now to President Putin over Ukraine, but he will look through those things to see where the real check on his actions might come from. Russia has long been the ally of Syria, and Mr Putin will have seen the UN and the EU virtually powerless to impose their will on President Assad, and he'll be further encouraged. Parallels with earlier periods of history might or might not be useful, but it can be argued that there are uncomfortable shadows of the 1930s starting to become visible. Meanwhile, while economies are still struggling to recover from the epic downturn in 2008, there is a lurking temptation to curb public expenditure further, as trailed by the Chancellor of the Exchequer in his recent budget speech. But to remove further resources from defence would be sending exactly the wrong message at this time. On the contrary, there is a growing argument to recognise that the international landscape is more challenging than in 2010 and that we should consider making a statement that greater military capability must underpin our diplomacy and the other instruments of our foreign and security policy. The projected 1% uplift in defence equipment procurement spending from 2015, though, wel though welcome, will do nothing to improve regular defence manning levels, which without a further uplift in spending will in all probability face further contraction such a conclusion is mathematically almost inevitable. Furthermore, my lords, genuine concern exists as to whether we can in fact recruit and train 30,000 members of the Army Reserve. And although we are only some six months into a five-year programme of recruitment, I am not alone in believing that current circumstances bring forward the need to alter the regular reserve balance within our Army and increase the size of the regular Army and probably the regular component of the Royal Navy as well. I believe there is an increasingly strong case to uplift the manning of our regular armed forces by some 5,000 posts. Not only would that be a useful increase in capability in itself, but would send a clear signal that the UK Government takes its defence responsibilities seriously, not only on behalf of its own citizens, but on behalf of our EU partners and NATO allies too. But noble Lords will have read this morning's comments by the Secretary-General of NATO calling for an increase in defence spending. Although our, our Government will argue that the United Kingdom still has the fourth, or is it now the fifth largest defence budget, it is proportionately down in terms of GDP from even five years ago, and represents a funding level that provides a lesser degree of defence capability than five years ago. Will the noble Lord the Minister confirm that whereas in 2008 
our land forces were able to deploy 10 combat brigades, going around two five-brigade cycles, conducting difficult operations in both Iraq and Afghanistan simultaneously, that that capability is no longer available and will not be under the plans for Army 2020. And furthermore, if the Noble Lord the Minister does confirm this, will he further confirm that this is not because of equipment shortages, but due to the lack of manpower, be it regular or reserve? So, my Lords, what is to be done? As much as I would like to see the 5,000 uplift in regular manpower across the three armed services that I'm calling for, I'm aware of the political calculation that there are no votes in defence. So I don't see this uplift happening before the next general election. But talking widely with many people within your Lordship's house and without that one meets, I wonder whether that calculation is in fact correct. Are there no votes in defence? Indeed, are there no votes in providing adequately for our national security? My Lords, I'm not so sure. At the very least, would the noble Lord the Minister use his good offices with the Government Chief Whip to programme a full debate on defence and security issues in this House in the next session of Parliament? Surely such a debate would be a major contribution to the strategic defence and security review that will follow the next election. Surely the people of this country deserve to hear the argument set out clearly before them, because at the end of the day, it is the votes of the people of this country that will determine the next government, and it's the first duty of that government to provide fully for the defence of the realm and the safety of our citizens, not forgetting the well-being of the members of the armed forces and their families who provide that defence and our safety. My Lords, I believe the case for re-examining our previous assumptions on military manning and the levels of risk that we are taking is a strong one, and if anything, getting stronger. My Lords, the House will be grateful to the noble and gallant Lord, Lord Dallet, for taking this albeit truncated opportunity uh, in which to raise what an important subject uh, that he has tonight. And I'd certainly echo his last comment, but I hope it will be possible uh, uh, early in the next session for a much more substantial debate uh, on these important issues, not least in the troubled times in which we now uh, may be finding ourselves. Uh, his, his debate, our, our motion, it says that asks the government and their assessment of whether they have sufficient manpower and the right balance of regular and reserve forces to meet the UK current national and international responsibilities and requirements. And as he rightly said, uh, they may look a bit different, the current responsibilities than they might have done uh, a few months ago. Uh, my Lords, uh, in, in looking at this, many noble lords will have uh, taken advantage to read the Select Committee report, the uh, Defence Select Committee report on Future Army 2020. And uh, the first point that I would make is that the Secretary of State makes no uh, bones about the matter in that report, in his answers to the Select Committee, that what we're dealing now is a de determination to meet a particular financial package into which defence uh, requirements and defence uh, equipment and resources have to fit. And, of course, that's not a pleasant position to be in, but it's certainly much more sensible to do that than to embark on rather more ambitious amb uh, uh, proposals for which actually there aren't adequate funds. And what the, I think the, uh, uh, our uh, armed forces are entitled to expect is some measure of certainty in the present situation that what we are embarking on can be properly funded uh, and uh, will therefore uh, uh, be likely to be properly Implemented, And so, in that sense, recognising the need for austerity, I support in that respect. But I do share the noble Lord's uh, concern about the recruitment of reserves. I, I look with particular interest to what small firms are saying about their ability to, uh, how they thought firms, their membership, would react to the uh, uh, situation of, of uh, making uh, their employees available for uh, service in the reserves. They recognise the benefits of it the benefits to the individuals concerned. But I noticed they said that two-thirds of, uh, two-fifths of those companies that are open to actually providing reserves actually had reservations uh, about their ability to help under the new structure, and that's a serious matter. And therefore I welcome the undertaking by the Secretary of State that he will keep this matter under close review. I was interested in the exchange between Colonel Bob Stewart and the Secretary of State and the uh, Chief of General Staff 
uh, when Bob Stewart asked for a short answer, what was the strength and what was the weakness of the uh, 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 future army, uh, future uh, 2020, a uh, future army 2020? They said, uh, and uh, General Wall said, the capability, the strength was the capability that we're getting for the resources allocated. That was a pretty guarded uh, statement. And the, the weakness was that some areas would have less resilience than we will need. Uh, and that uh, obviously is a matter of concern. The other element that I did notice that came through very strongly is that we're just talking here about regulars and reserves. Uh, but uh, Noble Order have noticed the emphasis that was also given to contractors uh, and undoubtedly the determination to actually make maximum use of contractors and contractors' manpower to help fill perhaps some of the gaps in that respect. And I welcome that because certainly in the past one found that that uh, can be a very effective and efficient way, uh, particularly in maintenance servicing perhaps of uh, important equipment of bringing in contractors from the actual manufacturers to do this. The other concern I do have is, and I'm not talking in detail about this, but in rebasing from Germany, uh, I hope very much that the issue of the quality of accommodation, which I think is going to be a major challenge for the Ministry of Defence, coming out of some very good facilities in Germany, I hope that those will be, uh, that our returning forces will have the accommodation, to, the quality of accommodation to which they are entitled. Uh, in the Select Committee report, <coughs> Uh, there seemed to be general agreement that it wasn't a question uh, um, of further intervention was not if, but when or where, uh, when and where. And uh, I certainly recognise that although uh, I myself was not in favour of intervention in Syria, there are undoubtedly likely to be, almost certain to be, cases were already involved in Somalia, uh, were already involved in Mali, uh, we are uh, helping training as well in Libya, that this activity of uh, conflict prevention capability building by training and helping countries to help themselves is going to be a very important role for armed forces continuing. And, of course, I welcome it from their point of view because with the end of the Afghanistan activities, uh, now there may appear to be a period of maybe rather dull service activity and rather dull servicing, uh, and that it is important that our forces have real and worthwhile activities to take into account. My Lords, we are, uh, as the noble Lord has said, at a dangerous time potentially. Uh, we can't be sure of the latest news coming out of uh, the Ukraine where that might lead. Uh, we hope that good sense will prevail. But at the same time, it's quite clear that we need to keep a very close eye on our resources. We need to keep the issue and the new changes in, under close review. Uh, and I welcome the opportunity that the noble Lord has given us to raise this point and to urge the government to be ready to have a further, rather longer period of proper discussion on these matters in the new session of Parliament. Um, I congratulate also Noble Lord Danat and, uh, and Noble and Gallant Lord to bring this before the House, and I uh, agree with a very large amount of what he said. I also particularly agree that we need a longer debate on this. I did, in fact, write to the Chief Whip the other week saying that we needed a debate on our relationship with Russia because it is far more important than just Ukraine and the countries of East Europe and the Russians need to hear what we're saying here and in the House of Commons through their defence attaches and their political advisers. It is very important they hear that. My own view, as I spelled out on the 18th of March in the debate on Ukraine, is that this is far more serious and long-running than we are allowing ourselves to believe at the moment. And so I suppose the short answer I would have to the question implied in the motion before the House is do we think uh, the balance between our reserve and, and, uh, and other forces is right and do we think it meets the current needs of the day? The answer is it might if we're very lucky. But I have to say, I don't think we are going to be that lucky. One thing I would be saying and wanting is for the government and indeed both houses to look much more seriously at what is happening with that defence at the moment in our relationship with Russia as well, because it is not just about Ukraine. What President Putin has done is to 
bring out the Russian nationalist card. And in doing that, he has given a great boost to morale in Russia. And I do understand, as I said on the 18th of March, why Russia feels marginalized and undervalued. I understand all of that and the disastrous history they had throughout the 20th century. The way it is being dealt with is profoundly serious. Commentators tend to focus just on the issue of what will Russia do in Ukraine. But there are other questions, my lords, about this, and it is about the Russian population in the other East European states. Because if they choose to say, right, we want to have our voice heard, we will do what they're doing in the Ukraine or did in Crimea, then I have to say it is not just an issue of confrontation, serious as that would be between NATO and Russia. It would also be a question of whether some of those states began to disintegrate rather in the format of the former Yugoslavia, but without the religious, religious factors that were present in the former Yugoslavia. You cannot underestimate that. And if NATO is then required to do, a, whether it's a policing operation or rather more than that, you do have to say that the balance between reserve and volunteer forces is probably wrong, and also that the act of reducing the size of our armed forces at the moment is also wrong. And I would say that in the current climate even, if, uh, and I have no wish to return to the Cold War or to talk about hot wars even less, but I do say that when you're in a situation of such uncertainty as this, reducing your defences is a mistake and that we ought to be doing exactly what the United States is doing, and indeed one or two other NATO countries, which is making a military presence in some of those East European countries. It's not just that the United States has got a, a, a new air squadron present in some of them, it's also the Italians have deployed a naval ship in the Baltic states. Now, I would ask the Minister in his response to say what we are doing, because there does need to be a clear message that we do have a military impact there and we want to make that known because at the same time we do have to have very serious discussions with the Russians about how we address some of their very genuine and understandable concerns and how we address the issue in those uh, East European states about minority Russian, Russian groups. There are important arguments to be had there. They are not just about the military balance, but I have to say without the military balance bit you risk things getting out of control. We often look at Mr. Putin and think that he is in some way a master planner of the old KGB variety. I'm sure he's of the old KGB variety, but I am not so sure that he's quite the master planner, and I'm certainly not sure that he's in control of events in the way that he likes, because once you release that Russian nationalist card, there is no controlling it. And that's why I say uh, to the Minister, I think you know, we do need to think about the Strategic Defence Review due next year. I have to say we need to start thinking about it right now. And the debate on defence would be an important part of that. A deployment of some type of military forces in East Europe would be uh, welcome. And as I say, I would be in favour of some increase in military expenditure in order to meet the needs we're, uh, we're, doing, uh, we're, we're facing. This is not just about a recreating a Cold War situation. It is about recognising that the present situation is far more serious and ongoing than we're giving it credit to, and in those situations you need to have a preparation on the military side while you develop a, a, a very different diplomatic response to what we've had in the recent past. My Lords, I rise to congratulate the noble Lord, Lord Dannett, on securing this debate and very much support the broad thrust of his remarks. We have a backdrop of a world sadly full of conflict and uncertainty and a backdrop of increased Russian and Chinese defence expenditure. Unfortunately, we in the West are going in the other direction. Last week, General Sir Richard Sheriff, our outgoing NATO Deputy Supreme Commander, was quoted as saying, quote, the sort of defence cuts we have seen have really hollowed out the British armed forces, and I think people need to sit up and recognise that. My Lords, the plan to reduce the regular forces and increase significantly our reserves presented a real opportunity to enthuse and capture the country's imagination. Some months ago in this chamber, I recommended that our reserves be retitled something more exciting, like the Prince's Royal Reserves. Instead, we've continued with the dull, stale words of reserve and reserves, and it's no wonder that there are problems with reserve recruitment. Like other noble lords, 
I would welcome a full defence debate. But I want to take this opportunity of just asking a few brief questions, uh, most of which I've given notice to my noble friend. Does he really believe that we have sufficient escort vessels to fulfil our, our international responsibilities? We have nominally 19 escorts, probably only a dozen or so operational. On the carriers, it suggested that additional costs above the latest baseline of £6.2 billion will be shared 50-50 between the private sector and MOD. Is that, in fact, the, the situation? And could he tell us also where we're up to with the crow's nest radar? Will that be ready in time? On the next generation of Type 26 frigates, is the plan still to buy 13? And are we still on target to complete the final supplier selection for major items by the end of this year? When is the maritime reconnaissance asset, Sea Eagle, launched from the back of ships likely to come into service? And on UAVs, what is the state of play on Watchkeeper, which had its first full flight training test last month? On UAVs generally, does he agree with a former Israeli Air Force commander who said recently, and I quote, the attack helicopter is finished and that unmanned air-to-air combat is a realistic prospect within 15 years. Does my noble friend believe that we're spending enough on UAV development and procurement? On the Air Force, there are suggestions that the joint strike fighter development in the United States is slipping further behind schedule. Would you comment on that, please, because clearly it's so important to us in this country? Uh, and on the Army, leaving aside special forces, what is our current attitude to parachute training? How many service personnel are being trained each year? Uh, my Lords, I too would like to uh, thank the noble and gallant Lord, Lord Dannett, for giving us this opportunity to discuss this important matter. I'd also like to take the opportunity to uh, pay tribute to all those uh, who, with great commitment and sometimes uh, with uh, great cost and self-sacrifice, are actually putting their lives on the line for us and for the defence of our nation. It's important to remember uh, some of those who are now in active service. I'm going to refrain from commenting on technical military matters and just raise two specific points quite briefly, if I may. Firstly, as well as ensuring that our country is properly defended, uh, it is vital that we maintain the capacity to contribute to the increasing need for peacekeeping in our world, and not least with the United Nations. Uh, these uh, uh, missions are essential if we're going to protect civilians when hostilities break out and stop them escalating. And they're vital if we're going to create the conditions for rebuilding peace and for establishing strong democratic governments. Uh, Britain already supports a number of UN peacekeeping missions in Cyprus, the Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan, and these are long-term commitments. They don't just go away, they eat up many of our resources. After the United States of America, Japan, uh, France and Germany were the next largest contributor to the UN peacekeeping budget. And one of, as one of the largest economies in the world, we have a moral duty to provide help where we can if we are going to uh, try and create new alliances, if we're trying to uh, help those places which uh, are facing really serious uh, uh, problems and divisions. Uh, noble Lords have already referred to the fact that world events can change rapidly, Ukraine. But of course we also sometimes look to our armed forces to help when there are emergencies in this country. It wasn't many weeks ago where uh, parts of our country were facing uh, flooding and we were very grateful to be able to call upon them to, uh, take, uh, to help us in those situations. We do need to have spare capacity and we need resources which are flexible, and I have no doubt that reserve forces are an important element in this, as long as they're not the uh, increase in reserve forces are not used as an excuse to just see them as a replacement for 
uh, endlessly cutting our regular forces. The second point I want to make is if we are going to see some fundamental changes in the balance of how we uh, 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 sort out our defences, uh, not least by a serious increase in the number of reservists and the use of reserve forces, uh, we do need to ensure that the resources are refocused to support particularly the reservists. The regular forces have the huge advantage of being based on or close to military establishments. There are opportunities for their families to uh, meet and offer mutual support. Local schools are always alert to the huge stresses put on to the children, and we mustn't forget those, the children of those who are serving uh, actively servicing, serving, and some of the excellent charities and support services are close at hand, and indeed chaplaincy is usually available on those military sites. But for many reservists, there is of course no similar support in the immediate locality when they return, uh, especially if they live in rural areas far from large urban centres. It's been hugely encouraging to hear about the impact and success of the Armed Forces Community Covenant, um, when the Covenant was signed in my hometown, St Albans, in December 2011, between the Armed Forces, representatives of the Royal British Legion, the County Council and all the district and borough councils, um, also included significantly was Hertfordshire Enterprise Partnership, Job Centre Plus and Hertfordshire NHS. Although it does concern me that we weren't given an opportunity to join in with thinking about how we can offer chaplaincy and support, particularly, as I say, to reservists, and indeed there was no mention of how schools were going to be included, so that where uh, reservists were coming back and uh, children had found this particularly stressful, they were being included and supported. And I hope that as uh, these covenants are rolled out, we can think how we can particularly draw in the voluntary sector to offer real and significant uh, support to those who put themselves on the line in the defence of our country. Uh, my Lords, I uh, strongly share the concerns raised by the noble Lord, Lord Dennett. Uh, the, the professionalism, resilience and indeed the sacrifices, as the uh, Right Reverend Prelate has just said, of servicemen and women are plain for all to see. And senior, highly trained and experienced military officers in or with recent direct experience of very responsible national and international positions know what they're talking about. So I was simply astonished to read 10 days ago that the Secretary of State had described as nonsense the statements made by a senior officer on retirement about his concerns for the present and future capability of the armed services, most especially the Royal Navy, but also about manning in general and the reserves in particular. Now, my lords, those views may be politically inconvenient, but are very widely, widely held and articulated. And the House of Commons ninth report on the future Army 2020 hardly provides a ringing endorsement of government policy, even if the economic factors the country faces are very real. So nonsense, those comments certainly are not. Reserve servicemen and women must be trained to a high standard and to be fit for deployment. Not much argument about that. One imperative is to provide the right incentive for them, often known as the proposition. Unless opportunities for training, provision of equipment and direct comparabilities provided in almost every way with the regulars, that proposition will be very difficult to deliver. And in any case, it will not necessarily be a cheaper option. Recent operations, of course, could not have been successfully prosecuted without extensive, extensive use of reservists. As the noble Lord Lord Dannett said, the target of 30,000 deployable reservists by 2018 is a tall order. The programme to recruit them has got to, off to a shaky start because of the errors apparently made within the Ministry of Defence and a contract with Capita. The final figure may not be achieved or ultimately sustainable. Attracting redundant or other former ex-regulars to the reserves appears to be proving difficult, and I hope my noble friend will be able to give us figures for that. My lords, I spent many years as chairman of the National Employer Advisory Board for the reserves, and so have a long-standing interest 
in how uh, their future in what is proposed is going to develop. Uh, and I would love to know from the government how confident they are that the employer aspects of reservists, especially in the need to ensure that leave for training time can be made available at no detriment to employer or employee. Reservists must be as thoroughly trained as and interchangeable with their regular counterparts. What are the up-to-date figures for recruiting and sustaining reservists against the targets that have been set? And what are the same figures for the regular services, particularly the Army? Uh, what are the current rates of premature volu voluntary release of servicemen and women? My Lords, I hope my noble friend can give answers to these, some of which I've been able to give him notice of. Concerns remain about the entire Middle East and the rise in Islamic fundamentalism. But as the noble Lord, Lord Dannett, said, we've recently seen disturbing destabilization on the, fringes of Eastern, uh, 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 on the eastern fringes of Europe. Our foreign policy towards Russia, with its recent acquisitive and bellicose ambitions and substantial military muscle, understandably dwells on economic and even personal sanctions. But no foreign policy can be fully effective if not reinforced by the capability of credible military response, the underpinning uh, to which the neighbour Lord Lord Dannett referred, in keeping with our international obligations should that ghastly prospect prove necessary. And that seems to be very much the burden of the noble Lord's question. My Lord's defence capability is a form of insurance, and I'm afraid that we seem to have got pretty close to our policy documents becoming invalid. My Lords, I also rise to congratulate the noble and gallant Lord, Lord Dannett, uh, for calling this debate and for his powerful speech. It's a compelling irony that the Secretary-General of NATO set the scene for this debate in an article in today's Daily Telegraph. My Lords, long ago, Russia's, long before Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea, there was much to concern us about its future foreign and defence intentions. Russia some time ago embarked on a massive program of rearming and re-equipping its armed forces. Is my noble friend able to quantify the expenditure Russia has set aside for this purpose? And will he write to me explaining what naval, military, air and other assets will be coming into service as a result of Russia's huge expenditure and personnel ramifications? My Lords, Russia's economy is potentially very fragile. It is quite possible that energy prices will force fall significantly. Russia is already in deficit. Corruption and nepotism are rife. There is a rapidly falling population. The legal system and press and media are not considered to be independent of the executive. All the apparatus of an autocracy are in place. If there are strains, greater strains, on the Russian economy, it's not difficult to speculate how this regime or another even more hardline regime might react. There are so many other areas in the world of mounting tension. Not just the Middle East, most of Africa, China and Japan have got long-standing difficulties between them. North Korea, certain parts of South America is even unrest in certain parts of the European Union. The USA cannot, my lords, be expected to continue to bear nearly three-quarters of NATO's total defence expenditure. We must honour our treaty obligations. As I have said before, I wholeheartedly support the full Trident replacement programme. Will my noble friend be able to tell us this evening how this is proceeding? Finally, will my noble friend be able to tell the House what effect these events are having on government policy? My noble friend gave me some encouragement in a reply to an oral question some months ago that the government understood that the Royal Navy required some 2,000 or so additional personnel to man the aircraft carriers. For reasons that have already been given, particularly by the noble, Lord, 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 and, noble and gallant Lord, Lord Dannett, we also need more personnel in the regular teeth arms, the Royal Marines and the Army. I hope the Government are aware of this 
and I hope that the, my noble friend will be able to give us some encouragement. <clears throat> my lords, in the 2007 book, uh, The Black Swan, Taylor was at pains to point out that the trick in dealing with black swans is not predicting them as outliers, they frankly defy prediction of any sort, but rather with ensuring that you can cope with them and have the resilience to do so. Last year, would anyone really have assumed that we would have been looking at the invasion of a large Eastern European country by resurgent Russia? Almost certainly not. And the outgoing Secretary General of NATO said, every ally needs to invest the necessary resources and the right capabilities. In the long run, a lack of security would be more costly than investing now, and we owe it to our forces and to broader society. And as noble Lord, Lord Lee referred, um, I wouldn't I'm quoting General Sir Richard Sheriff. I wouldn't want to let anybody think that I think that Army 2020 is good news. It is not. The sort of defence cuts we have seen have really hollowed out the British Armed Forces, and I think that people need to sit up and recognise that. So the troops are going down. The Army strength from 102,000, and by 2020, 82,000. Um, we won't even be able to fill Wembley Stadium. And as Professor Michael Clark the director of the Royal United Services Institute, with 82,000, we've got a one-shot army. If we don't get it right first time, there probably won't be a second chance. I thank the noble and gallant Lord, Lord Dannett, for initiating this debate, and he said when the coalition took its decision on the size and shape of the armed forces at the time of its SDSR in 2010, it did so in the midst of an economic crisis. But doubt has remained as to whether a regular army of just 82,000 is sufficient for our needs and whether the target of 30,000 trained reservists is achievable. My Lords, the whole armed forces are undergoing a huge reduction, a reduction of 33,000 or 19% by 2020. 5,500 Royal Navy, 8,000 Royal Air Force, and 19,500 from the Army. And in his scathing assessment, General Sir Richard Sheriff has said Britain is now the only NATO state not to commit any of its naval forces to maritime operations. And this is what I find shocking, and Noble Lord, Lord Ben Arthur referred to this. When asked about Sir Richard's comments yesterday, Mr. Hammond said, much of what I'm hearing is nonsense. This is our great military expert, our Defence Secretary. He dismissed calls from Lord Dannett, the former head of the army, to halt the withdrawal of British troops from Germany in order to send a military statement to Putin saying tank regiments are more effective based in Britain, the great general, Secretary of State Hammond. My Lords, the head of the Defence Committee, James Arbuthnot, said he thought ministers should rethink the cuts that the Army's permanent staff in light of Crimea. The sheer number of armed forces are much low, lower now than they should be in order to protect our interests, is what he said. The Financial Times said a leaked report from the Ministry of Defence last year suggested the plans to restructure the army were in chaos because potential reservists were being put off by a sense of gloom surrounding the armed forces. Could the noble lord, the minister, confirm this? And, of course, Robert Gates, the former US Def Defence Secretary, warned Britain it would, would not have the ability to be a full partner after the cuts because it would lack the full spectrum of military capabilities. The Defence Committee report also criticised a lack of clarity from ministers on how to deal with cyber attacks warning that an emphasis needs to be placed on ensuring the critical systems and resilient to attack and contingency plans for recovery in place. Could the noble lord, the minister, confirm this? And the noble lord, Lord Dannett, has mentioned very clearly that when the cuts were announced, it was a time of economic crisis. The international landscape, he says now, is much more challenging than in 2010. Making a statement that greater military capability must underpin our diplomatic forces. So the current Chief of Defence Staff, General Sir Nick Houghton, warned last year that Britain's military could become a hollow force with state-of-the-art equipment, but no one to operate this. My Lords, even the Chief of the General Staff, Sir Peter Wall, has added that ultimately history tells us that some circumstances, committed land forces may be the only way to achieve decisive outcomes in support of our strategic objectives. My Lords, will the Noble Lord the Minister confirm that the cuts have all been about means before ends. We will have the smallest army in 200 years. And in 2010, the SDSR got rid of our harriers, our carriers, our nimrods. And we've been fighting in Afghanistan, and we've had one black swan after another, the Arab Spring, Libya, Syria, Ukraine, Crimea. What next? Could the noble lord, the minister, confirm 
that the morale of our armed forces is in a very sorry state and needs to be addressed. And what about the esprit de corps? To confirm the state of esprit de corps, the essence of our armed forces. We're at the top table of the world, my lords. We have tremendous soft power, but we need the hard power. We need the critical mass. And to conclude, as General Sir Richard Sheriff said, we all support the efforts to get the deficit down, but it's all about priorities. What really matters? Well, the first duty of government is to protect the nation. And the electorate need to understand that there is no point in having hospitals and schools and welfare unless the country is safe. My Lords, um, may I join um, many of your Lordships in, um, in, in fact, I think all of, all of your Lordships uh, in thanking the noble and gallant Lord, Lord Dannett, for initiating this debate. May I offer him um, some support? I think I speak for a number of my colleagues that if he's able to persuade through the normal channels uh, for us to have uh, in your Lordship's uh, house a full debate on defence, then he can count on me as to be one of his footrunners on this particular issue. <clears throat> uh, my Lords, I, I want to concentrate um, on the issue of the reserves, uh, the planned total um, of reserves, 30,000, uh, and may I say that uh, my noble friend, uh, Lord Trafkan, for whom I used to work as a junior minister in the Ministry of Defence, will uh, echo uh, my recollection that if you, if, if you go back 10 or 15 years, the then Territorial Army had a trained force of over 50,000. So to get to 30,000 does not seem to me uh, to be either impractical or, or impossible. And I want to explain why uh, that I, I think it is uh, uh, of some significance and importance that we stick to that target. Uh, my own experience as President of the Reserve Forces and Cadets Association for 10 years uh, was that there were uh, some very important advantages uh, in having um, what was then called the Territorial Army, the Reserve Forces, uh, drawn from large and small employers, but throughout the country. Uh, and that is the first point to make, that I think it's quite wrong, it would be quite wrong to ditch the target of 30,000 or reduce it in any way at all, because it is a footprint across the whole of the country. Uh, and with the regular army in particular, withdrawing into a number of very large uh, garrisons uh, around the country, the footprint of the armed services uh, could be reduced, I think, uh, to our great disadvantage unless we maintain our target of 30,000. Uh, and I think to even speculate about reducing that at this stage would send entirely the wrong signal uh, to the efforts being made by employers, my noble friend, uh, the, who... Um, was responsible for liaison between large employers and the armed forces, I'm sure will echo this, that it would send a confusing signal at this stage when so much effort is being made. And, and I have to tell you, um, um, Your Lordships, that the recent figures for recruitment uh, into the uh, uh, reserve forces has, uh, has begun to improve. Uh, if you go back three or four months... Uh, there was some serious difficulties, but now uh, uh, the, the, the indications are that recruitment is better. And we must maintain that national footprint of the reserve forces for political reasons, small p, not party political, but to make sure that uh, we have the support and encouragement uh, of our population for our armed forces. Uh, and <clears throat> the 30,000... Uh, target will include many specialists, and the nature of the reserve forces has changed uh, over the last 10 or 20 years. We're recruiting more sp those with skills uh, either in the medical profession uh, or in construction, uh, and I think that they complement so effectively and so successfully our regular forces. Now, we have a five-year 
uh, campaign running. I'm, I'm quite confident that we will reach the target and I'm not in favour of sending a signal at this stage of reducing the target for our reserve forces uh, and uh, to compensate for the need, it is argued, for increasing our regular forces. I think we ought to stick to our guns. Um, Maybe an inappropriate comment, but I think it's true. We can reach 30,000 by 2018, and uh, I look forward very much indeed to working with the noble and gallant Lord, Lord Dennett, in securing that a full day's debate in your Lordship's House. My Lord, I join with other members of the House in congratulating and thanking the noble Lord, Lord Dennett, for this short debate this evening. Um, It's actually been one of a number of probing and questioning of the Government's policy, whether it's been by written, oral questions, or indeed uh, debates. And I think the fact is that the government have not convinced people that their approach and policy is right on this area. Um, They don't appear to have convinced the House of Commons Select Committee in another place, nor indeed experienced spokespeople in this area. I I turned for this debate to the recent report of the Armed Forces Pay Review Body, an organisation which meets face-to-face every year several thousand of our armed forces personnel. And in their report, at paragraph 211, they say there'd been notable drops in reported morale from army personnel for the third consecutive year. For every year of this coalition government, morale has dropped in our armed forces. That's on the surveys that have taken place. 2.12 2.12 goes on to say, a continuing high tempo with much operational commitment at the same time as the impact of the redundancy programme was being felt. And 2.13 in the same section talks about the continued erosion of the overall package together with the impact of the redundancy process were felt to be adversely affecting morale, which was already considered to be fragile. The facts linked with that, my lords, are that the working hours of our armed forces personnel last year, mainly before these redundancies were complete, were up to 47.9 hours a week. That's the average, week in and week out. And the average weekly duty hours increased by three hours in one year to 70.7 hours a week. My Lord, I believe that is something we need to take into account when we consider the wording of this motion as regards the assessment of whether we have sufficient manpower in the armed forces. Any commercial organisation, in my experience, when making such fundamental changes, would do it incrementally, and as you make one change, you would increase another. But what we've done here, the government have done, is to go forward with these redundancies. And they've no idea whether, in the end, they're going to be able to recruit the 30,000 reserve personnel. I hope they are able to. But it's the transitional period between now and then, which, in my view, is a great danger for us as a nation, as we've seen in the latest developments in Europe. In a letter accompanying this report from the noble lord, the minister... He said they accepted all of the Armed Forces Pay Review Body recommendations. So I'd therefore like to ask the Minister this evening if he could tell us what the Government are going to do. One, about the morale issue, which is obviously uh, some of it, not all of it, but some of it as a direct result of these changes. And what are they going to do about the overall working hours of our Armed Forces personnel? In the House of Commons Defence Select Committee report published on the 29th of January, paragraph 31, page 11, says it's essential that the MOD budget settlement allows for delivery of Army 2020. I cannot find any overall commitment from the Treasury where they have confirmed categorically that the money will be available for this. And I'd like to ask the Minister if he's able to give us that assurance. My Lords, the first responsibility of any government is defence of the realm. 
And I would just ask the noble Lord the Minister, does he believe that either the state of morale of our armed forces, or indeed the numbers of our armed forces today, has sufficient manpower to deliver the defence of our realm? My Lords, I also welcome very much uh, this uh, debate uh, called by uh, the noble and gallant Lord uh, Lord, uh, Dannett. I was uh, privileged uh, for four years to uh, chair the EU subcommittee that dealt with uh, foreign affairs and defence, of which uh, uh, my noble friend uh, Lord Selkirk, uh, it was a pleasure to have him as a a member of that that group. And I want to pursue some of the themes that... uh, a couple of the themes that came out from some work we did on European defence... It seems to me, from from that, there were a handful of things that have changed quite substantially over the last couple of years. First of all was the American pivot to Asia, which sent out all sorts of messages, and uh, as may be a consequence of some of those uh, we've we've seen over the last uh, month. There was also uh, uh, very much uh, the... uh, move uh, of uh, Russia and we have the first threat to territorial integrity in Europe uh, for 24 years Uh, and we then have a number of smaller conflicts internal and ethnic conflicts particularly within North Africa and I just want to take one or two points from, from each of those. I don't think there's any dispute that the United States was going to pivot towards Asia and it's a defence treaty with, with Australia as well because Clearly, as we've seen uh, over the last six months, issues, very dangerous issues uh, within uh, East uh, China Sea, the South China Sea, the Korean Peninsula, show that we need very great attention there and that there needs to be a strong uh, American uh, presence, rhetoric and ability to act in that area. And so its move, looking less at uh, Africa and at Europe, was inevitable. And that is not going to change. And we saw in uh, 2011 that uh, America leading from the back in terms of the Libya operation. And we've also uh, seen uh, Robert Gates, uh, the Defence Secretary, say that uh, if NATO didn't get its act together, then the future of NATO would be dim and dismal, as indeed uh, perhaps it has uh, been shown to be uh, over the last year. Hopefully uh, hopefully that that will change. But in terms of Ukraine, I'm absolutely sure, as as the noble Lord Lord Soli has said, that we need to show more than economic uh, reaction to that, clearly uh, not military action at the the present, but we have to show strength in resolution together as uh, NATO and as uh, European states to to show that we are serious and we do not uh, take a... The, the, what I call the uh, Medvedev uh, doctrine of looking after Russian citizens outside Russia as being anything that's acceptable to, uh, to us as uh, nation states uh, west, of, uh, west of Russia. When we took evidence uh, around European defence, we were very struck at that time, it was about two years ago, how the Balkan states, how Poland said very strongly that they did not uh, see peace in Europe as being inevitable and that they feared the Russian Federation at that time. And I would say how right they have been uh, from that, uh, from that uh, evidence. Now, NATO uh, expenditure, I think, has moved down from something like 2.7% of GDP uh, in the 90s down now to something like uh, uh, 1.6%. And that uh, clearly is, uh, is a major change. I welcome that change in that direction, but there is always a time when that has to start to reverse. And if there is a time when it needs to reverse, it is now. And uh, and it's not just around GDP expenditure. One of the things that we saw within uh, European states was it is not just expenditure. Europe has 1.6, 1.7 million people in uniform, but very little ability actually to deploy them and certainly not deploying them without the help of the United States. And that's one of the areas that we need to change and we need to move forward with our European allies. The other area which is very relevant today is uh, the Central African Republic, where the European Union is now sending a force, uh, postponed after uh, some three months, yet that situation is absolutely critical there and is very telling given the 20 years after the Rwandan uh, situation. 
I was very pleased to see a uh, press release from, uh, the, from DFID saying that we were supporting security there, but we were doing it by giving £2 million to UNHCR, when, quite frankly, what is needed there is for us, whether it's within the context of the European Union force or uh, with France bilaterally, we need to send real military support there to stop the potential genocide that there will be between Muslims and Christians in that nation. President Obama said that uh, the EU uh, summit, uh, EU American summit uh, earlier this month, that freedom isn't free. That may be a cliche, that may sound trite, but my Lords, I believe at this time it is absolutely true. Yeah, yeah. My Lords, <clears throat> the thanks of all of us, and especially from myself, are due enormously this evening to the noble and gallant Lord, Lord Dannett uh, for uh, giving us the opportunity of just a starter a taster for what we hope will come later on in the session. He has probed, and I understand it may be fairly fertile ground with my noble friend, the Minister, that we may well be having a really full debate at a later stage in this session. But your Lordships may uh, recognise that the noble and gallant Lord, Lord Dannett, is a man of enormous expertise and competence. I know from my uh, uh, relations with him, and thanks to the noble Baroness Lady Dean and others with the House of Lords Defence Group, he is a soldier and a man of enormous charm. But as we've heard from the noble Lord Lord Billy Morio this evening, he's also a, a man of some considerable steel and says what needs to be said. He says it tactfully but realistically, and certainly uh, it may, may uh, hit hard with the Ministry of Defence, but certainly it is recognised with enormous gratitude in your Lordship's house. Now, thank goodness, um, I looked at the, um, at the timetable, my Lords, and found that I had just three minutes, so I shall be certainly under that, because the text for this evening's uh, question of the noble and gallant Lord uh, was particularly the reserve and regular forces. Now, we, and we've had notable speeches from uh, my noble friend, Lord Freeman, and indeed uh, from uh, the, the uh, on, uh, reserve forces, particularly from the two, and my noble friend, Lord Glenarvan. I apologise. Um, but <clears throat> when we have uh, been and looked at uh, various activities of the British Army and deployment in the last 10, 15 years, the, um, the, a number of the uh, uh, reservists who go to make up the total uh, number of forces who are sent overseas, particularly army. Uh, that is one particular aspect, but it is much, much more, and indeed my noble friend Lord Glen Arthur will know, it is the specialist forces, and particularly um, his, if I may call them, medics, um, who go at a very uh, long uh, deployment abroad, but they bring enormous skills, and without their skills, uh, operations in uh, uh, in, in, certainly in Afghanistan and elsewhere would be virtually impossible. Um, <clears throat> certainly medics, and I understand there are others and engineers in other particular disciplines um, who have these specialist skills and they are available. But certainly I understand, I think the three of the, uh, your Lordship have spoken this evening, the noble, my noble friend Lord King, my noble friend Lord Freeman and myself. We are conscripts. And uh, we go back 50 years from that. And as far as I recall, we were liable for two years full-time service and four years to be liable in the reserves. Now, certainly, I was never called up since I had a triple fracture of the leg that finished my uh, full-time career, um, and that probably would have ruled me out. I'm not too sure that quite what happened or what the rules were in the late 1950s. Uh, for uh, whether it was obligatory or indeed recommended that having spent two years full-time, you did four years as a reservist and you fulfilled your duties as far as that would be concerned. But certainly as far as uh, we, we have our current army <coughs> with, 80, uh, with uh, 82,000 and 30,000 reservists, at least that would be the old figure. Um, I hope that that would be quite enough uh, to fulfil what are national and, above all, international requirements, let alone responsibilities. Certainly, I would want to salute and be very grateful for, to the noble and gallant Lord, Lord Dammit for giving us the opportunity this evening and asking what needs to be done. 
May I conclude very swiftly by thanking uh, my noble friend, the Minister. Um, the noble Lord Billy Moria uh, was, uh, took a fair point, possibly, at uh, the Secretary of State, uh, right, on, uh, right on my friend, the Secretary of State. But I hope that he, and I hope your Lordship's House, and particularly those of us who have had the good luck to serve with the House of Lords Defence Group, recognise that my noble friend, the Minister, is certainly one of the most outstanding defence ministers in your Lordship's House. I have spent 41 years with the House of Lords Defence Group. I first went in 1973 to Royal Air Force Lucas and Royal Air Force King Ross. And in all that time, I have learned and learned and learned. But one thing that I have learned is that how lucky we are to have the constant support that we have from my noble friend, the Minister, and his colleagues in the Ministry of Defence. But we are even luckier to have the support that we have had this evening from the noble and gallant Lord Lord Dannett, and I can't wait to hear what my noble friend has to say. I must declare an interest first in that I'm a member of the Reserve Forces and Cadets Association in Northern Ireland. Um, my interest in these affairs comes from the fact that I was regular army and I then served with, in Northern Ireland with part-time or reservist people, and I've now been involved with the Territorial Army. My few short remarks refer to the Army Reserves and to the target of 30,000 that we've heard about, fully trained re reservists. I would like to ask the Minister directly now what, where those 30,000 are going to come from, because at no time in the Reserve Forces history has the full complement been fully trained, and therefore 30,000 members does not in all our own experience, refer to 30,000 fully trained. It is normally 75% or below. In Northern Ireland, the reserves were fully recruited and even over-recruited until the introduction of Capita, the new recruiting agency, into this process. The province also had the highest percentage deployment rate per capita of the population. But recruiting is now going down. What has changed? It's not the availability of potential recruits. The conditions of service are now improving, so they're even better as time goes on. Only one thing has changed. The introduction of an agency and the breaking of that vital personal contact during the initial stages of recruitment into the reserves. The government may feel that this is moving with the times, and you may compare it with modern banking and the increasing lack of personal contact with the branch managers and staff. However, we all have to bank somewhere, so we have to put up with that. But potential um, reservists recruiting is different. They are probably employed and live within happy families and are looking for a new dimension to their lives with others from their local community. They do not have to join, do not have to deal with the faceless internet, and they do not want delay and hassle on top of their daily lives. Northern Ireland was 100% recruited through the traditional recruiting carried out by local subunits, through the schools, sporting clubs, other clubs, and their friends, of, of, um, their friends who may be current reservists. This new system has failed to be user-friendly at the very first hurdle. Also, the government must adapt their recruiting of reserves to the changing circumstances today. Since the Iraq war, they have joined out the reservists to go on operations, but now we are back to a training role and no impending operation, which we are all very thankful for. It can be a different type of person who will be required, different support required for their families, and even more enhanced support for their employers who may be less inclined in the long term to permit staff off for training and topping up the numbers in the regular units, which seems a thankless task to an employer. And it's interesting that during the troubles in Northern Ireland, where we use so many part-time people, towards the end, not only businesses, but government departments were becoming reluctant, like uh, schools, like roads, like housing, were becoming more and more reluctant to allow their people away. So, this has not got the long life that perhaps the government would like to think. I suggest that the government have a much larger mountain to climb than they think, and I look forward to the noble Lord the Minister to tell us how they think that they will do it. Time will tell. 
Uh, my Lord, could I too add uh, my thanks to those already expressed to the noble and gallant Lord, Lord Dannett, for securing this uh, all too short debate on our reserve and regular armed forces. And I uh, also wish to endorse the tribute by the Right Reverend Prelate to our armed forces. By now, of course, the key questions have already been raised, and uh, not least by my noble friend Baroness Dean on the state of armed forces morale and by other noble lords on recent developments around the world. And I just wish to re-emphasise one or two points. I recognise that the noble and gallant Lord Lord Dannett referred to all three armed services and that concerns have been voiced in particular about personnel numbers in the Royal uh, Navy. However, I wish to confine the rest of my comments uh, to the Army. When the announcement was made by the former Secretary of State for Defence that the size of the regular army was to be further reduced to 82,000, some 12,000 below the figure stated in the 2010 Strategic Defence and Security Review, he did it against the backdrop of an announcement that the size of the trained army reserve force would be increased from 19,000 to 30,000 by 2018. And the former Secretary of State has also since confirmed that the rundown in the size of the regular army was linked to the increase in the size of the reserve forces. And that would seem a logical stance to adopt since the increase in the number of reservists should be achievable if the government are determined to provide whatever money is required to achieve that objective. Though that, of course, does not necessarily mean that sufficient recruits of the required quality with the required skills will be secured. That policy has now been changed by the government, who have repeatedly declined to give assurances that the regular army will only be reduced in line with the intended increase in the size of the trained reserve force being achieved. And that decision raises important issues. The first is that the government must believe that a regular army of 82,000 is sufficient to deliver the military capacity and capability objective in the defence planning assumptions on which the Strategic Defence and Security Review is based without any increase in the size or change in the composition of our reserve forces. If the government do not believe this, and I'm asking the noble Lord the Minister to confirm the government's position, then declining to make the reduction in the size of our regular army dependent on achieving the intended increase in the size of our reserve forces must be putting the military capacity and capability objective in the SDSR at risk and with it our national security as well. However, if the government do confirm that their position is that a regular army of 82,000 can deliver the military capacity objectives in the SDSR without increasing the size of our trained reserve force, then that invites the question as to why we're increasing the size of our reserve forces to 30,000 and for what military and national security objectives are we doing so. The government have also inferred that the increased trained reserve force will be providing some specialist skills which our regular forces will not possess to a sufficient degree. If that is the case, and I would be grateful if the noble Lord the Minister could confirm the government's position on that point, how is it that the rundown in the strength of our regular army is not dependent on the increase in our trained reserve force, even in respect of these specialist skills, if our national security is to be safeguarded? Now, I hope the points I've just raised are ones to which the Noble Lord, the Minister, will also respond in his reply to this debate. Finally, and reference has already been made to the committee, uh, the House of Commons Defence Select Committee expressed their doubts in a recent report that the Army 2020 plan represents a fully thought through and tested concept which will allow the Army to counter emerging and uncertain threats and develop a contingent capability to deal with unforeseen circumstances. The Ministry of Defence, uh, they said, that's the Defence Select Committee, needs to justify how the conclusion was reached that the Army 2020 plan of 82,000 regular and 30,000 reserves represented the best way of countering these threats. 
and no doubt the Select Committee's point is one to which the Noble Lord the Minister will also wish to respond. My Lords, I'm also grateful to the, the Noble Lord, Lord Dunnett, for introducing this very important issue. And I share the Right Reverend Prelate's thoughts for those members of the armed forces serving on operations and, of course, for their families. It is right that we should do everything we can to ensure our country uh, isn't caught unawares in the event of unforeseen crises and threats. The question of the Noble Lord uh, concerns the sufficiency of our manpower, and in addressing it, I think we should look first at the existing scope and scale of our commitments worldwide. Currently, we have more than 30,000 servicemen and women committed on operations. They are providing significant contributions to security and stabilization in Afghanistan, combating piracy off the Horn of Africa, countering narcotics in the Caribbean, keeping out all vital choke points in the Straits of Hormuz, and recently we have seen British Armed Forces support the French in Mali. We have deployed HMS Daring and HMS Illustrious to the Philippines to assist in the humanitarian effort in the wake of the hurricane. We have seen regulars and reserves protecting possessions and property against the recent floods. And my Lords, in the past week, we have dispatched a submarine to help hunt for the missing Malaysian aeroplane. These are examples of the activity that our armed forces are currently engaged in, and my Lords, all happening in a period of transition. If anyone was under the illusion that the post-Afghanistan world would be a quieter place than events in Syria and latterly in Ukraine, have swiftly dispelled that illusion. Um, several noble lords, including my noble friends Lord King and Lord Burnett, have asked about Ukraine. What has happened there, my lords, is completely indefensible. This is the most serious risk to European security we have seen so far in the 21st century. The priority now is to deter further Russian military action de-escalate and find a diplomatic solution. The government has made it clear that it remains committed to a diplomatic solution to the current crisis in Crimea and Ukraine, and in this respect is pursuing a number of diplomatic and economic initiatives, including targeted sanctions and representations in international fora. In terms of reassuring allies, the UK was one of the first to offer tangible contributions with our offer to supplement NATO's peacetime Baltic air, air policing mission. NATO will continue to provide appropriate reinforcement and visible assurance of NATO's cohesion and commitment to deterrence and collective defence against any threat of aggression to the alliance. Um, my noble friend Lord Bennett asked about Russian defence spending. Russia has previously stated that it intends to increase defence spending. It, ends, it intends to spend $650 billion up to 2020. This includes acquiring eight nuclear submarines, 600 jets, 1,000 helicopters and 100 warships in an attempt to modernise its armed forces. The Noble Lord, Lord Soley, um, mentioned the next SDSR. Clearly, the SDSR in 2015 will consider whether our foreign policy and security objectives have changed in the intervening five years and the implications for our armed forces. The Noble Lord, Lord um, Dannett, asked what we are able to do under Future Force 2020. Um, my Lords, it will enable us to simultaneously conduct an enduring stabilisation operation of up to 6,500 personnel, equivalent to operations in Afghanistan over the last decade, one non-enduring complex intervention of up to 2,000 personnel, equivalent to that undertaken in Libya, and one non-enduring simple intervention of up to 1,000 personnel, equivalent to the UK's support to France in Mali. This level of capability has been tested against a wide range of scenarios and, a whole, and the whole of government assessment of the likely future threats and commitments facing the UK we are confident that it allows us to protect and promote the UK and its interests in an effective, sustainable manner. 
Um, uh, the noble lord also asked about risks. Uh, the armed forces are going through significant restructuring, and throughout this period there will be shortages in some roles. However, we can be clear that there are safeguards in place to ensure frontline operational capability is not uh, affected. All three services continue to recruit, and the Army recently launched a major recruiting drive for both regulars and reservists. We are confident that we have and will continue to have the right personnel and skill sets to satisfy all strategic defence um, priorities. Um, several noble lords, including my noble friend um, Lord Lee, the right reverend prelate, the Bishop of St Albans, the noble lord Lord Benamoria, and my noble friend Lord Lyle, asked about reserve recruitment. Um, my lord's latest reserves recruitment campaign began in January. All three services have used a range of advertising methods from radio, TV and online recruitment targeted at the youth audience to uh, deploy deploying uniformed personnel at prominent locations such as shopping centres. The initial response to the recruiting campaign is encouraging, um, as my noble friend Lord Freeman said. Local reserve units have been heavily involved in recruiting activity as they know their local areas best of all. From this, the Army is analysing lessons identified and reports of good practice and encouraging units to share and promote their good practice. Um, we have introduced a number of new initiatives to simplify the recruiting process. These include the revised medical process in January and the new online application forms. It is still early days. The length of time it takes applicants to progress through the application and training pipelines means it will take time for the actual impact to become realised, but we are very positive. Um, my noble friend, Lord Glenarthur, asked about recruiting levels against 2018 target for reservists and regulars and also about retention in the regulars. Um, my lords, the figures released on the 13th of February by Defence Statistics demonstrate that the reserve forces are on track to meet or even exceed the interim target for April of this year. We have always said that growing the reserves would be a challenge and the start of that challenge is reserve reversing the long decline in numbers. The train strength figures were expected to dip initially because it takes around two years for a recruit to complete the training and join the trained strength. Army regular recruiting is forecasting a 30% shortfall in soldier entrance caused by a combination of factors. This is being tackled through improvement to the recruiting process. This shortfall has been taken into account in our manpower forecasting and planning. Under 20, Army 2020, the regular army is reducing from 102,000 to 82,500. Today, the army has a shortfall of some 4,000 people against the structure, but this will be cancelled um, out as the structure is reduced over the next three years. Current voluntary outflow levels are above the 10-year average. The range of criteria used when forecasting VO is wide and includes economic advice from the Office of Budget Responsibility, historic behaviour and expected trends. The result of this forecast was used when modelling the requirements and led to a reduced requirement for tranche 4. Um, my noble friend Lord Lee asked me about the carriers and the cost increases. Uh, until a new contract is signed, the current agreement remains extant, which agreed a 90 to 10% share of costs. The Secretary of State stated in November 2013, under the new agreement, any variations above or below that price will be shared on a 50-50 basis between government and industry until all the contractor's profit is lost. The revised deal, including the revised 50-50 share line that better incentivises industry to control costs by allocating an equitable share should costs grow beyond the new target, is expected to be approved this spring and the new contract will be signed on completion. My noble friend also asked about escorts. The Royal Navy has 19 operational frigates and destroyers, 13 Type 23 frigates and 6 Type 45 destroyers. These ships are held at varying degrees of readiness. 
Three ships are currently deployed overseas conducting operations in the Persian Gulf, the Eastern Mediterranean and the Atlantic. Four ships are undergoing training in preparation for forthcoming international deployments or are held at high readiness for contingency operations. One is conducting defence engagement in Dover in support of HMS Cavalier 70th anniversary celebrations. Eight are in routine maintenance in home, in home port and three are in deep maintenance. I hope that addresses my noble friend's questions. He also asked about the uh, Joint Strike Fighter um, dates. Uh, initially, initial operating capability for the UK's um, F-35 aircraft is scheduled for December 8, 18, with carrier strike capability scheduled for 2020, and I'm happy to tell my noble friend that these remain on track. My noble friend asked for an update on Scan Eagle. Um, the Scan Eagle has been successfully, swiftly and safely introduced into service, fulfilling an urgent operational requirement. This day and night uh, capable UAS is operated from Royal Navy and Royal Fleet Auxiliary vessels and provides an important op uplift in persistent surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities. It is currently in use on deployed operations, providing real-time intelligence to the ship staff and has already proved itself to be an important addition to our maritime capabilities. Um, then my noble friend asked how many Type 26 and the current the government's current planning assumption is the construction of 30, 13 one, three, Type 26. Um, my Lords, I will do my very best to answer as many questions um, as I have time, but I am conscious I won't be able to do that, and I will write to those noble lords and copy in all other noble lords who have spoken in the debate. Um, several noble lords, including the noble lord, Lord Bill and Moria, and the Noble Baroness Lady Dean and the Noble Lord Lord Rossa um, asked about morale. My Lords, this is a challenging time for defence. Morale and esprit de corps is monitored um, within the Armed Forces Continuous Attitude Survey. We take this issue very seriously and we are, we are aware that we have work to do. Um, my Noble Friend Lord Bennett asked about the Trident replacement over the next year, the programme will continue to evolve as the submarine design matures and detailed preparations will continue for Main Gate in 2016, ensuring that the design, costings and procurement strategy are mature. A further report to Parliament will be made later this year. My noble friend Lord King um, mentioned small to medium um, enterprises and their concerns over reliance on reservists. We recognise the contribution of SMEs and that reserve service can affect them more greatly than larger firms. That is why we are bringing in employer incentive payments of up to £500 per reservist per month when a reservist is mobilised. Um, my noble friend also asked about accommodation in the UK for forces returning from Germany. The MOD has set aside £1.6 billion to implement the Army Basing Plan providing nearly um, 1,900 new service family accommodations and 4,800 new single living bed spaces. Um, the Noble Lord, Lord Billamore, asked our resilience to cyber attack. Defence takes um, cyber security extremely seriously. Across the UK as a whole, cyber skills are in short supply. The best way to address this is a mixture of regular and reserve forces, starting... Um, the Noble Baroness Lady Dean um, asked about working hours and minimum wage. We work to ensure that the sacrifices, dedication of our personnel is recognised. Uh, they have continued to benefit from pay rises um, and other benefits, including subsidised accommodation, generous pensions and plenty of paid leave. It is therefore entirely misleading to suggest that any of them earn less than the minimum wage. Um, my Lords, I am, am running out of time, but this Government has taken difficult decisions in order to preserve the sustainability of the armed forces. That was the responsible course of action. Nobody thought the transformation of our armed forces into Future Force 2020 would be easy. If they did, it would have been done much sooner. The services are rising admir admirably to the challenges of change. They are shaping their own future. 
while continuing to deliver everything required of them in current operations. My, my Lords, I beg to move the House to now adjourn. That the House do now adjourn. <laughs>